Do you do the countdown? And uh, when you have to share your screen. Yeah, just give me a second. And we are live. Well, welcome. It's Friday night. Can everybody hear us? We are on once again. And uh, so we're talking about lung disease, the lungs. That's that thing next to the heart, I think. Um, <laughs> Wow, you're great at anatomy, Dr. Kenya. <laughs> We're going to have some fun today, and uh, we can start off with our first picture of the day. So we had a very interesting week, and we can see there is uh, Jen in the corner with Chad, and we brought some healthy food. And you know that middle picture there? That's um, my wife, some cooking last night, so I got home late last night, and she made me this fish with vegetables. It was fantastic. Chose eating too much, and you can see on your right is that, um, that that's lunch this week, and you can see the fridge. So we're going to actually be looking at your fridge one of these days and um, tossing out the foods that are not good. Anybody can see anything that we should toss out of that fridge there? Uh, that's the fridge at the office. In the middle, we see some of our our mask of the week, and uh, so right now is that one of the things we have to at some point to Paul and uh, Stewart and and. Uh, and everybody else, we have to look at, you know, how to reevaluate the mask and what, what to do about that because that's, that's a changing field right now. And uh, if you know what to do about your mask, you're better than the rest of us because most of us are still a little confused and we're still learning about masks. But we're, we'll try to put some, um, some science and some practicalities to that right now is that uh, we're, we're now 7,000 masks strong in the clinic. So we've got enough for a little bit. And uh, so... Uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> And uh, the last thing um, I learned about them is that uh, you look like they protect you as well as the people who are around you. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, so so let's uh, I've actually I've, I've been reading up on that as well. Apparently the highest risk is when you and someone you're talking to right in front of you are both not wearing masks. Mm -hmm. Risk is reduced by about half when one of you is wearing a mask and substantially further on both of you wearing masks as well. Okay. And uh, does it matter if you're singing or not? Yeah, that does matter, actually. <laughs> so singing, um, you know, singing involves a lot of vibrations of the voice, and those vibrations actually uh, sort of release a lot more of these tiny particles that also go further as well. Um, so normally when we're talking, it doesn't go as far, and we have sort of bigger particles that are easier for masks to block. Um, but singing has a lot of the tinier particles that can make it harder for blocking. Yeah, so it's interesting that loud noises, singing, being inside, increases transmission. So one of the things is go outside um, and, uh, and talk softly. Don't get too close. Keep your keep that six-foot rule at this stage of the game. And um, interesting who to allow in your bubble at this stage. So that's a changing world. So my bubble is basically healthy food, surrounding myself with smart, caring people. And let's learn about, about the lungs. Let's 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 get the next let's get let's get the next slide there. Oh, this is this is Lucy. Um, um, what's the, uh, Lucy? What's your dog's name again? Lucy's gone. Um, <laughs> yeah, Natasha's dog named Lucy. That's Lucy and Natasha. I'm sorry, oh, <laughs> dementia's catching up with me. So that's Lucy and uh, Natasha. Has been working in the clinic, and she's been cutie with a brand new puppy, and the dog is growing. And uh, those I, I, you know, one of the things is that I don't think Lucy likes to walk as much as as as, as, as she should. So look at Lucy; she has those big paws, and uh, she needs to walk a lot more. <laughs> get a dog. So what I've learned is that um, one of the things is people who have pets live longer. So uh, there, there's a, there's a. Um, I mean, we have three dogs, four cats, um, two little baby chicks, um, one sheep, and two baby ponies. I hope that makes me live a long time. <laughs> um, so uh, get yourself a pet. Get outside. It, the weather's beautiful. Take advantage of this. Um, next slide. Managing your lungs. Um, this is an important topic. So... Um, we get short of breath for all sorts of reasons, and we get injured our lungs for uh, all sorts of reasons too as well. So one thing is that we learned that COVID uh, likes to go to the lungs through something called uh, ACE receptors, and uh, they're found in the nose, they're found in the lungs, they're found in different parts of the body as well. So is that how to protect your lungs 
and knowing, do you have a lung problem? Am I short of breath because I'm just deconditioned? I'm overweight, heart failure. Do I have a COPD lung disease, restrictive lung disease? Uh, and so we got lots to learn about. And so this is really exciting. I was looking at the presentation. I learned a lot, and there's a lot more to go. So um, let's move forward. What's the next slide show us? Who's going to be talking first? That would be me. So hi, guys. I'm Cushy. I'm one of the volunteers at Dr. Kearney's clinic. So as Dr. Kearney mentioned already, we're going to be touching on lung diseases today. So this is a brief table of contents to give you an overview of what we'll be covering. So we can go on to the next slide. So we're just going to start off by taking a really quick brief look at our anatomy of our lungs. Well, just pause so, for a second. Isn't that a beautiful slide? I love this. I was just staring at this for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that was the point. It's <laughs> unmitted as well and everything. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, the lungs are actually found on the right and left side of our chest. Um, the air that we breathe in enters our nose and our mouth, and then it th flows through the throat, which is the pharynx, and the voice box, which is known as the larynx, and it enters the windpipe, which is also known as the trachea. The trachea then divides into two hollow tubes called bronchi, and we have the right main bronchus as well as the left main bronchus, and both of them supply their respective ones, so the right and left lung. And then these bronchi then go on to divide into even smaller bronchi, um, which further divide into hollow tubes called bronchioles. So the medical term for the air tubes that all this air is going through from the nose to, to the mouth to the bronchioles is actually called the respiratory tract. And at the very end of the smallest bronchioles are tiny air sacs called alveoli. So these alveoli are lined with a very thin layer of cells which actually allow for gas exchange. They also have an excellent blood supply. So the tiny alveoli are the place where oxygen enters the blood and where carbon dioxide leaves the blood. And the respiratory system is actually lined with a mucous membrane that secretes mucus. And what this mucus does is it allows for um, us to trap smaller particles like pollen or smoke. And they have hair-like structures called cilia um, that line the mucous membrane. And their job is to move the particles that are trapped in the mucus out of the nose. So that's a little brief anatomy of our lungs, and we can move on. So there are actually two classifications of lung diseases, obstructive and restrictive. Uh, while both can actually cause a shortness of breath, obstructive lung diseases such as asthma or COPD, which we'll later cover, actually cause more difficulty with exhaling air, whereas restrictive lung diseases such as pulmonary fibrosis cause problems with, restrict, uh, with restricting a person's ability to inhale air. So it's the opposite. We can move on. So, hi everyone. My name is Emma, and I'm just going to be taking on the next section about diagnosing lung disease. We're going to start off with the roots, so the risk factors for lung disease in general. Of course, smoking is one of the biggest risk factors. So, if you do smoke, this is a perfect time during COVID to stop. We'll be talking about some tips for smoking cessation later on. Some other risk factors include pollutants. So that could be occupational, where you work, as well as environmental, so just where you live. Maybe the quality of air um, is not super great. As well, if you did experience frequent childhood respiratory infections, you may be at risk for developing lung disease in the future. So some symptoms that you might notice if you do have lung disease or you are developing lung disease include shortness of breath, coughing, excessive mucus production, wheezing, as well as chest pain. And of course, the symptom list goes on and is more specific towards each specific lung disease, but these are just some general ones that you might experience. And then as for the diagnosis procedure, typically what will happen is um, you will get an extensive medical history taken, and then the physician, the doctor, might do a physical exam. Afterwards, it's very common for you to be then sent to get a chest x-ray done, and then after that, some pulmonary function tests or any other testing that you may need. What's kind of interesting is that um, you're going to start off with the chest x-ray and show you next oh, actually that's a good slide to, to, to pause on there is that I grew up with lots of chest x-rays and what I'm learning right now is that if I had a choice between a chest x-ray and pulmonary function test or spirometry I think for the vast majority of the patients I see I would prefer pulmonary function test mm -hmm. or spirometry. And we'll, we'll learn a little bit about that. So I don't do as many chest X-rays as, as I used to, um, but I'm doing a lot more something called spirometry, which we'll explore right now. We'll, we'll find out why. So, Corinna, uh, are you there? 
Yes, hi. Hi there, Corinne. So Corinne's our local respiratory expert. Um, and so Corinne, if you had to pick between a chest x-ray or, or, or pulmonary function test and spirometry, what would you pick? I would choose uh, pulmonary function or spirometry because okay. the accumulation of rate radiation in your lungs is likely not a good idea. Also, too, is that um, people think the x-ray tells you a lot. It certainly tells you a lot, but we can do a whole lot better than the plain chest x-ray. So uh, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's go forward. So. Um, so, yeah, like you guys were mentioning, the pulmonary function test. Go back to my chest x-ray earlier. Okay. I was just thinking about the chest x-ray. One of the things that chest x-rays are really good at is, is helping us looking at the heart and the lungs as well and, and, and the space around that. And so you can see that you found a mass in one of those areas. You can sometimes see congestive heart failure, enlargement of the heart. So it really gives us lots of clues. But it, it, it's not as precise as we, we, we thought about it was to be. So, so chest x-rays are still useful. I'm not saying that, but um, it's just a starting point. Go ahead. So yeah, exactly. It reveals some information, and it's just a starting point as to like where next should we make sure that we hit all the tests for that area. So one of them is, are the pulmonary function tests, or known as PFTs. And so from my research, I found three kind of main-ish ones. There's a spirometry, which Corinne will be talking about in a moment. And then there's also the plethysmography um, and the diffusion capacity test. So I'll just go over the last two really quickly, and then I'll pass it over to Corinne. So if we move on to the next page... We see to the left, we have the plethysmography. And so when I was doing research, I thought it was really cool because you actually take a look at the testing booth. It looks kind of like you're in a little telephone booth or something about to be shot into space. I thought it looked really cool. Um, and <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so the general idea is that it measures lung volume. Um, the three specific measurements that I found included the total lung capacity, TLC, um, as well as the functional residual capacity, the FRC, which is basically, if you were just to breathe out right now, the amount of air left in your lungs, as well as the residual capacity. So if you were to breathe out really heavily right now and just try to squeeze all the air out, that's what, whatever's left is the residual capacity. And so the plethysmography uses changes in pressure to detect these different values. And then if we look over to the right, we see the diffusion capacity test. Some doctors may refer also to it as the DLCO. And it basically tests your lungs function of gas exchange in the alveoli that we talked about previously. Um, so what will happen is that typically you'll be asked to breathe in a small amount of CO2 and a tracer gas, such as methane or helium. You'll be asked to hold your breath for 10 seconds and then rapidly exhale and blow out as much air as possible. And then they're going to test that air to see how much of the initial tracer gas is actually left. And that just tells them how much gas is absorbed and how well your lungs are still functioning in that sense. Um, and then on to the next slide. So these are just some additional testings that you may undergo. And I think myself included, sometimes we forget that the lungs and the heart are quite interrelated. So some lung diseases will affect your heart and vice versa. Um, so you, will, you might get additional heart-related testing if your doctor thinks that's necessary. And so on to the next slide, I will now pass it off to Corinne. Um, so spirometry is the easiest way to determine patients' lung uh, volumes. And this can be done in any doctor's office. Uh, you, don't you don't have to go to a big telephone box, as Emma has suggested earlier. But that's exactly what, how we describe it in the PFT lab. So the gold standard for COPD is uh, to it to assess lung functions and the total and what a spirometry is is a big deep breath in and an ex total exhale volume of expelled air after the big inhalation and that's how we measure um, lung volumes so here's a, a lab doing a big deep breath in big 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 and blast out as hard and as fast as possible for as long as possible. These are some types of spirometry devices. Um, when I first became a respiratory therapist, um, when your grandparents were born, uh, we had huge devices, like, and they were portable at that time, 
and they were, but they were large. Now we have everything from from a bellows device, which is just means there's um, an artificial lung where the air is blowing out. We have electronic desktop one uh, types, and I think Dr. Kernu has one of uh, one similar to this, and then a handheld device which can be picked up. Now, I guess I've heard on Amazon, and you can test your lungs anytime. It's small in, and inexpensive. That's okay. Sorry, who's who's in control? That's me. Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't quite sure. I want to move on. That's okay, Witty. Uh, so these are just types. I don't want to spend too much time on them, but you can see now that these devices measure everything the same as the device in the telephone booth, except. We don't have the comparison of the uh, pressure inside the lung compared to the pressure in the booth. It's quite interesting how this technology is changing. Um, um, I'm quite amazed that uh, many, do not too many doctors do spirometry in their office at this stage. And it because it, it well, it, it's, in one sense, it's easy to do. It's hard to learn how to do it well and properly. And now these handheld devices is that, um, you know, at one time we just measured blood pressure in the doctor's office. Now we measure blood pressure at home. And I'm thinking for more and more of us right now uh, that getting your own spirometry at home if you have lung problems is probably a good idea. We're going to talk about that a little bit more as time goes on. Um, at one time these machines were thousands of dollars. Now they were talking about hundreds of dollars. And uh, we'll, 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 we're, we're getting down to is that you can probably get a spirometry apparatus for yourself between one hundred to two hundred dollars at this stage, um, and and that's you know that, that can be quite valuable if you have lung problems. Uh, we heard before is that you know quality of the, the air, um, and um, and to make the diagnosis of COPD, obstructive lung disease, it's not a chest X-ray; it's spirometry equipment, and managing your health is kind of important as well. So. Um, one of the big things I learned about spirometry, and I think the best part, Paul, what's my favorite part about spirometry machines? That would be the lung gauge. <laughs> lung gauge. So, you know, is that um, today I, I saw someone today who was, you know, 50 years of age. I should smoke a little bit. Her lung gauge was over 80. Um, that's so that's important to find that out. So we're going to find that out more for uh, as time goes on. Go ahead there, Corinne. So I, I, like, I like using lung gauge as well. It's particularly to show a patient who feels that they don't have lung disease. Oh, I only smoke on the weekends or, you know, I only go to campfires um, on the weekends. Lung age is an, it uses an algorithm, but, but it, it, it lights that, that light bulb in their head. And, and when they see that lung age, they're, they're mortified. Okay. Mm -hmm. Luggage can also just be by compression of your chest as well. So you're, you know, you, you, you weigh 50, 50 extra pounds. That compresses your, your lungs and it reduces your lung age. So we got lots to learn about. So go yeah. ahead there. Okay. So with spirometry, we can determine, we can definitely um, diagnose asthma and COPD. Um, we can confirm any presence of airway obstruction, even if the patient has no symptoms. And we're able, uh, we're also able to assess the severity of the airway obstruction. Um, and, and then it's up to Dr. Kernu to assess the prognosis. And, and the respiratory therapist will continue to monitor the patient's um, disease progression. So the types of patterns are, uh, as was explained earlier, a normal pattern or restrictive obstructive or mixed obstructive restrictive so I know those, these are terms that we're bantering about but normal would be somebody like Paul who gets up there does the test yay and even me because I've never smoked um, but Paul would be a perfect example of a young man's lungs I'm I'm the perfect example of an old lady's lungs and and as as Paul gets older, his lungs will look more, if he continues to live the life that he's living, the clean life, um, we, you begin to lose 
just like muscle mass, you begin to lose lung uh, volume as you age. Okay, okay um, Winnie. So, uh, now we're going to go into the acronyms. So, the FEV1 is just the forced expired volume in one second. So, that's that big... <gasps> And, and that in that one second, the machine will capture that one second, uh, one second of breath coming out. And we always like that to be over 80%. Uh, even, even as an older adult, uh, my lungs are still over 80% in an FEV1. Um, so the, it's the volume of air expired in the first second of the blow. Now the FVC which is the forced vital capacity and that's the breath that you that is immediately following so I'm going to just give an example because it's a lot easier it's a big breath in that's my inhalation and now I'm going to blow out hard and fast <sighs> five four three two and one squeezing all the air out of your the lungs after your force uh, for a force vital capacity is what um, I think Emily might have described earlier. Sorry, I forget who it was. But your lungs are like a sponge, so by squeezing all the air out, we can determine how much air is coming out of your lungs, and and a predicted volume, uh, predicted our predicted percentages is over eighty percent again. So these two. These two numbers are critical because now we take those two values, the FVV1 over the FVC as a ratio, and we determine how healthy your lungs are. So usually it's between 0.7 and 0.8. So that means that um, you should get over 80% of your breaths in the first second. That's Paul's lungs. But as we get older, we lose a little bit of the elasticity. So starting somewhere in our, in our, in our mid-twenties, most of us have deterioration of lung function as, as they age. And so a 70-year-old lung will not have the same elasticity as a, as a 20-year-old. But you know what? Uh, Paul, for, you, for me to, to, to compete with you for lung function, I need to be fit. I need to be skinny. So uh, you can actually really strengthen your lungs by, by preventing the decay that takes place. And also getting fit, like mentioned, is that they're, they're trainable. The, the muscles around your lungs are very trainable. Um, and so we get better. Um, yes, there are genetic factors. Yes, there's environmental factors. But you're in control of how quickly your lungs are going to age. And unfortunately or fortunately, the biggest factor that plays the largest role for most of us, smoking. Either first or second hand smoke. So um, if you smoke, stop. And if you, if you love someone, don't smoke around them. Very good. Um, the, this graph that is on the screen at the moment shows you and, and shows Dr. Kernu what we're talking about. That FEV1 in one, in one second, and that's the big peak that comes blasting out. Oh, good. Thank you. Thanks. And now, there, as I said before, there's always like your lung has a, it's like a, like a sponge. It's still squeezing air out. And there we go up that curve. And we're continuing, 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 squeezing, squeezing. And here is the plateau. And that's how much air is in your lungs after you do, after you do a forced blow. So uh, that, that's pretty, did, do you want to talk to this at all? Uh, so I like this slide because it shows, it compares the difference. So the red is the normal, and now somebody who, who has a, a, a injured lungs. And that's um, usually smoking induced. The most common cause of this, or 80% of this obstructive lung disease is smoking. And, and Dr. Kearney is right. Uh, so you can see the person who blew out on the white curve right from the beginning at the beginning where's your little arrow winnie go down yeah 
to the left. Well, yes. So now that person is pushing out the air as hard and as fast as they can, but you can compare it with the red one, and it's nowhere near the nice peak. There's obstruction. There's um, clogging in the tubing that's not allowing the air to escape as easily. And as the patient, as the person continues to blow, you can see how much of a struggle it is to get the air out. So that, that's a very um, uh, good graph of obstructive lung disease. And the bottom, the bottom um, axis is the, the time. And so you can see after six seconds, most people after four seconds with obstructive lung disease cannot get any more air out because all the little alveoli, all the little airways in the lungs are closing down now. Okay. <clears throat> so um, this is another fabulous slide. Uh, on this slide you can see we talked about obstructive lung disease. I'm going to um, slow and do some long time full of skin. So the white, the, we're talking about obstructive lung disease on this, on the far left, yes. After somebody, so the first, gra the first line, the bottom line is without medication. And sometimes after a pa we, we see this graph, we'll give the patient some Ventolin, a, a short acting beta agonist wait 10 to 15 minutes and repeat the test. And here we have some improvement. So we can see that there's some, it, it's, mod, it's very modest, but there is some improvement. And this is a typical pattern for somebody who was a smoker, is a smoker. It's a typical obstructive pattern. The, the middle graph is the restrictive graph. And you, as you can see there, that patient isn't having trouble getting the air out. They're having trouble inhaling a deep enough breath to get the air out. Everything comes out really quickly. You can almost see that it, it quite parallels that of the normal lung in the first one second. But that's it. That's all they can get out. And it could, restrictive lung disease could could be a lot of things, but if you could think of um, somebody putting a, an elastic band around your ribs, or if you, you put on a really tight shirt, uh, or try to pull off a, a tight shirt, if that if those that elastic is holding your ribs in, there's no way you can blow out fast. And and then we'll go to the third one. Um, the mixed is some obstructive, some restrictive, and that can be somebody who has asthma and COPD. So it's a very slow rise, and and it never really reaches a full volume. You can see a little bit of a plateau toward the end, and, and that patient has a combination. When I see a graph like that, I think, I don't know, let's give, let's give that patient some um, short-acting beta agonists and see the response. Oftentimes you don't get a good response. There's no significant reaction. So it's kind of interesting. On your far left, the biggest problem is smoking. In the middle graph with restriction, there's a couple things that cause restriction that you can do something about. You mentioned that elastic band. For many people, that elastic band is just too much body weight and uh, losing some weight will make a huge difference and you'll feel better, you'll feel less short of breaths. And the other thing is that as we get deconditioned, the muscles get deconditioned. So to me is that restriction for many people can be improved by exercise and weight reduction. And, and th those are things that are so, so key an issue. And of course, um, I hate to harbor about people who smoke. I know how difficult it is. And I know it's, a, it's a, one of the biggest challenges. So two of the biggest things I'm asking people to do right now is lose weight and not smoke is are huge undertakings. But they're actually, um, like anything, if you work at it, you can get better at it. And uh, what I've learned is the harder you work, the more chance of success. If, if you walk in with that attitude, well, you know, this is how I cope with stress, this is, this is the way things are, then you're going to be short of breath.
but saying is that, you know what, I'm struggling to make healthy changes. This, right now I'm having my, my salad tonight, and um, and I'd rather have cheesecake, but um, <laughs> I'm playing tennis at uh, 6.30 tomorrow morning. I'm going to go for a bike ride. I, it, I'm, I'm enjoying the process. Will I get where I want to be? No, but, um, you know, it's... Well, let's try something because these are the physiological changes that uh, current so eloquently tells us about, and uh, do something. It makes some steps, and and the most important thing is do something. So it's just don't just sit there anymore. Make some changes, and just help the person next to you. Okay, uh, I have a question from YouTube from Anne or either uh, Dr. Cooney or Corinne. Not too sure if either of you will uh, quite exactly know the answer, but. Uh, for what for people who've had radiation treatments, for example, for breast cancer and experiencing breathlessness, uh, that's um, how might these breaths be affected as well? Well, um, uh, once you if you if you're treated with chemotherapy, and then sometimes people with um, breast cancer after chemotherapy they have radiation. The radiation does sometimes have an effect on, it depends, it, I can't, I don't want to just paint it with the same brush, but it can have an effect. Um, if, if a tumor in the lungs, for example, is by the diaphragm, which, which and if the belly is, is just, uh, large, you know, if you're overweight and your belly is pushing up against um, the diaphragm, which push, which which squeezes your lungs. You think of a pregnant lady, and when she when she's healthy and and pregnancy is healthy, but as she reaches her last trimester, she, now all the weight of the baby is pushing up against her lungs. She becomes short of breath. She could become shorter of breath than usual. I'm not really answering your question, Paul, but but yes, I'm going to say. Um, people who've had breast cancer and have experienced some therapy, it, it can play havoc with your lungs. Well, I'm going to make it a little bit, uh, the way I look at it is, so I, breast cancer, so some of the things, it, it is complicated. One of the things is, after breast cancer, you might have been depressed, not exercising, so you might have been deconditioned. Uh, number two is you could have, have a weight problem that, that, that's worsened. Some of the therapies for breast cancer can affect the heart and weaken the heart muscle. Um, also, the cancer can actually spread sometimes to the, the lungs, and so we have to find that, that source. You also could be, become anemic because of the chemotherapy. So there's all sorts of reasons, but there, what you need to do, you need to get proper investigation about that. So that, that's, that's the jobs for your physicians to, to look at that with your healthcare team. So uh, it could be some of those factors or others as well. So um, there's no one solution, but certainly having um, some spirometry done afterwards is I find that, um, you know, maybe you smoked for 20 years, uh, 10 years ago, and you have some lung disease that you didn't know. As you age, you lose lung function. Uh, so there's all sorts of factors in this. So it requires a proper evaluation. Um, and um, we can certainly do that with you, and your doctors can, can work on that. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's, this is what I give to Dr. Kernu at the end of every patient. And this is, he, Dr. Kernu will look at this graph and based on, um, based on the parameters and the predicted values, we can determine what is going on with this person's lungs. So we like to see a big peak, a nice emptiness so that's the one second of exhalation and now now here we are with then that's the feb1 now after that part we keep blowing and keep blowing and keep blowing until we empty our lungs and and once we reach you know some people will be coughing and some people will will feel like they're passing out and some people will say i could go on for once we reach that point then we suck in the air because we want to replenish what we've just blown out. And that's what we call the residual volume. That volume helps us to determine how easily 
we were able to inhale. And that there's a lot of there are a lot of clues in this one little graph. So these are the standard tests uh, on on all spirometers, desktop and um, in the big, in the telephone booth. So one of the reasons we're showing you this is that why should I know? Is that you should know why you're short of breaths, uh, and you should also, as time goes on, I think many people are. Sh are going to should think about getting a home spirometer at some point in time. So you need to understand a little bit about this, and we'll teach you more about this. So it's kind of interesting to see, you know, physiology in action, and it's good to know that um, you can be short of breath for all sorts of reasons, and one is the lungs. And this is something that um, um, <clears throat> I learned a lot in the last number of years, and I'm still learning more about this. Thank you, Corinne. Keep going. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Winnie. I think we've solved all those problems earlier. Um, so, this is the flow volume curve. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it is interesting to see the, the, top, the top curve on the, the one on the left. This is the expiratory flow rate. So, this is the one where you're blowing hard and as hard as you can, blowing out. The top one is the normal. And the predicted value for that for for you for that for your patient, the bottom one is what your act, the actual uh, coming out, and you can see the variance in those two uh, graphs. So the reduced peak flow, which is the first blow at the beginning in one second, and you can see how scooped out that curve is in the center. And that, that's, that is our typical obstructive pattern. Um, clogged airways trying to blow the air out quickly. The second, uh, the second graph is, as we're following this patient on the left, um, maybe within two or three years or not, or maybe this is a brand new patient, but you can see how severely obstructed that graph is in the second in, in the second um, the second blow um, and but you can notice that those two bottom graphs are very similar in in shape one is just more obstructive more severely obstructive than um, the other so I'm thinking of that first graph someone's been smoking for a pack of pack of cigarettes for about, you know, 15 years, and that's what your lungs might look like, and the next person is smoking two packs or a pack and a half for about 10, 15 years, so we call something called packier history. Um, this is what happens if you smoke a pack of cigarettes for, for 20 years or so for, for many individuals. That's scary. And, and it is, and some, you know, unfortunately, I've seen the middle pattern in a young person, somebody under 30 years old. And it's a heartbreak because you know that that muscle, that lung um, will never be recovered. So now that now we have to manage that person for the rest of their lives, how to condition their lungs, how to manage their disease. Yeah, it's sad is because that um, my favorite um smoking character with Spock on Star Trek, Leonard Nimoy. He smoked a, a pack a day for about 30 years, and I uh, said, so that didn't bother me. Uh, then um, he stopped smoking 10, 20 years later, he died of severe COPD, because what happens was, is that as you age, you lose lung function, and smoking accelerates that process. So um, I need my lungs to carry me to uh, 70, 80, maybe to 100 years of age. Um, I keep saying this, I plan to retire on my 100th birthday party uh, after I climb the CN Tower with Paul and, uh, and the rest of the team there. So anybody wants to... to Who are you on? <laughs> so anybody who's, who's there is welcome and, uh, and uh, move forward. So uh, um, I'm, I'm not as fit as I used to be, but I'm, 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 I'm working at it. I'm having a lot of fun at this. So please look at... Uh, this is important. and, and, um, and we, and we often find this disease before you have any symptoms. So if you've been smoking for 10, 20 years or you, you think uh, you're fine, you're probably not. And, and Dr. 
Dr. Kernu makes a really good point. You know, the, the easiest thing for people to do is just put on a pair of shoes and go for a walk. And every day extend your distance and your time. And before you know it, you're going to desire more. You're going to see the change. Your pants are going to fit better. It, it's wonderful. And the time you're symptomatic, you have a lot of lung problems. Yeah. So the last, the last graph is the restrictive pattern. <clears throat> we, I see this about twenty percent of the time in my practice. Um, it, has, it has a normal shape blowout, as you can see. It, it comes up really high, and then, then it stops. It just like the person has no more. <clears throat> not enough time to blow it out. They just huh, empty their lungs. There's no obstruction to prevent that uh, air from flowing out. And people who have um, restrictive lung disease, such as um, I've lost, I've lost uh, all pulmonary fibrosis, for instance. Pulmonary fibrosis. So. With pulmonary fibrosis, the lungs aren't able to expand. They just can't blow out. Sometimes we have what we call honeybee pattern uh, inside the lungs. You can knock on the lungs, and and it's it's hard. It's not like a sponge. Imagine your sponge has lost a lot of volume, or it has a big gape in it. That's basically what restrictive lung disease is. Um, any questions? <laughs> That's great. Thank you. And, okay. Okay, so thank you, Corinne, for educating us on spirometry. That was helpful. So we're actually going to move on now, and we're going to take a closer look at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD. So COPD, as you previously mentioned, is an obstructive lung disease, which again, to refresh, it just basically means you have difficulty exhaling a normal amount of air when you're breathing. And COPD actually consists of two major breathing diseases. The diagram on your left illustrates chronic bronchitis, in which your airways become swollen and they become filled with mucus. And this essentially makes it hard for you to breathe. Um, the diagram on your right shows emphysema, and emphysema, your alveoli, or the air sacs uh, in your lungs become damaged. And this decreases the elasticity in your lungs, and that makes it hard for the alveoli to stay open when you breathe out. Um, this essentially means that there's a risk of your air sacs collapsing in on themselves and not expanding back out, which is why it's hard to breathe. So some common symptoms that you may experience if you have COPD include the following. Usually, most often, um, the most common symptom that you'll see is shortness of breath or breath breathlessness. Um, you'll also commonly see a daily cough with mucus production. Um, you'll also be feeling very tired or fatigued from the extra work that you're putting in to breathe. Um, people with COPD are also more likely to catch colds like the flu or pneumonia, and oftentimes these um, respiratory infections make breathing even more difficult, could further damage your lung tissue. You may also find yourself losing some weight without even trying. <laughs> you may also find weight without actually trying. Um, and also people with COPD suffer from anxiety or depression, and that's also associated with poor outcomes. Okay, so moving on to the risk factors that have been found to be associated with COPD and how the condition is actually diagnosed. Unsurprisingly, as we previously mentioned, smoking is the number one cause for COPD, and this also includes secondhand smoke as a risk factor itself. So smoking is, in general, um, a really big risk factor for many other types of lung diseases. So as you mentioned, this is a really great time to try and stop smoking, so keep that in mind. Other causes also include indoor and outdoor pollutants, which could be work-related or environmental. As well as, as well as having a family history of lung disease or even genetic disorders, um, such as a deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin, which may cause lung disease. So if you've been experiencing any number of these symptoms, such as a shortness of breath, coughing, increased mucus production, fatigue, and so on that we mentioned, you may have COPD and you'd want to see a doctor. And oftentimes what physicians um, do to diagnose this disease, we also previously mentioned, 
for the diagnostic test that includes spirometry, chest x-rays, even an arterial blood gas test, which actually measures the oxygen level in your blood. And they also take a look at your clinical history. So this is actually a screenshot which provides um, you an idea of the Medical Research Council breathlessness scale. And this offers um, a really good way for you to evaluate if you have a shortness of breath and if it's getting better or worse. It essentially consists of five statements that describe almost the entire range of respiratory disability and it can be self-administered or it could be administered by an interviewer with the statements framed as questions. And the score that you get is the number that basically fits the um, patient's level of activity. So we can move on. Flare-ups. Flare-ups are also known as exacerbations, and they basically mean a sudden flare-up of the symptoms that you've been experiencing. So a sudden increase in shortness of breath or a sudden increase in feeling fatigued and tired. So these are really important signs to be aware of, and if you do experience any flare-ups, you really want to get the help you need. Um, so you should visit a doctor or, or go to the hospital, and your physician will work with you to help manage um, future flare-ups from occurring as well. One of the things that we learned about flare-ups or COPD exacerbations, it's sort of the concussion to the lungs. So we learned that concussions to the head lead to chronic change. And every time you have a COPD exacerbation, it injures your lungs and it can lead to more permanent damage. So what you want to try to do is limit the amount of flare-ups that you have um, and also um, be aware of that every time you get these flare-ups, your lungs won't bounce back to the same degree. So I think a concussion to the head, um, banging of the head, I think of COP exacerbation as a concussion to the lungs. So we try very hard to avoid them. Uh, some are infectious, mostly from viruses, some are bacterial, uh, but many are just will flare-up because you, you showed in your picture you have the bronchia that are thickened, full of mucus and, and uh, thickened, and the airways that are being, have been destroyed. Um, so this is a progressive process for many, and so please, please, please think about how to protect your lungs, keep your lungs healthy, uh, eliminate the, the pollutants and the, the smoking. Um, and if you can't stop smoking, reduce. Go ahead, Rishi. So this next image is a screenshot of the COPD assessment tool. And this is actually used to help, help your doctor evaluate the impact of COPD on your daily activities. Uh, and if you go on to the next slide, you'll see that it provides you with a CAT score. Um, and you can use this with the, compare it to the gu guide that they provide you with. And it helps you understand a really good broad overview of the impact that COPD is having on your life. And in the previous slide, there's a link that you can access to get a copy of the COPD assessment test if you'd like. So we can move on. Yeah, everything will be provided underneath the video, or you can feel free to take a screenshot. But I think all of this is publicly available on the internet, so no worries if you aren't able to capture it right now. And don't forget, this is recorded. You can go back and look. What I do is I go back and look at them. I fast forward certain parts and rewind many parts. So. Uh, the first part was for uh, was quite uh, brain hard. A lot of you know a lot of science there, but uh, it's important to realize is that uh, uh, we learn how to understand science, interpret science, and, and you need to start thinking about how this affects you and how it affects people around you. Yeah. So over here, um, we talk about the bronchodilator reversibility test, which is basically used to differentiate between um, COPD or asthma, which again are both um, obstructive lung diseases. So when given bronchodilators, it was found that people with asthma will see a dramatic increase in their spirometry results, whereas COPD, COPD patients don't see this dramatic increase. Um, and what's outlined on the slide are these steps that are actually taken to perform this test and the expected results and what those results imply. So we'll just make a little point here is that in asthma, asthma is a disease of inflammation and it's treatable and it can be successfully treated with, with steroids in, in, many, in many individuals. Where COPD is destruction, actually you're destroying your, 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 your alveoli. Once you destroy your alveoli, you're not going to get that back. And, and so, so asthma is reversible, a COPD is a progressive illness. Now, there's always some degree of overlap. Some people can have some degree of asthma and COPD, and uh, 
and that's for your doctors and you to work with. But uh, if you have bad COPD, it's not going to get better. Um, there will be flare-ups, but it, it's, a, it's a progressive process. So the best way to prevent yourself from end-stage lung disease, and it's a terrible way of dying, is that uh, not breathing, not being able to put your clothes on, um, is a sad situation. So uh, the best way to treat is prevention, and it's very preventable. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the treatment plan. Um, and this is definitely something that if you do have COPD or any other lung diseases, that you do discuss this with your doctor and your healthcare team. And if you are a smoker, like we mentioned so many times, the best thing is to do is to quit smoking. So, what's that, sorry? I'm saying if you can't quit, reduce. So, you know, every time you smoke, you will lose five minutes of life. I'll repeat that. Every cigarette you will lose five minutes of life. A smoker has a 60% chance of dying from their tobacco. A smoker has a 60% chance of dying from tobacco. If a car dealership would sell you a car that would kill 60% of its drivers, they'd be out of business. So, you know the facts. I know how hard it is. Uh, I know stress, anxiety gets in the way, but, you know... I think dying of end-stage COPD is a very stressful condition for both you and your family. Um, let's find a, a better way. Go ahead there, Emma. And so if you can see at the bottom of the page, there are the bronchodilators and steroids. So these are medications that you'll discuss with your doctor and see which one fits best for you. Bronchodilators, what they do is they widen up the airway. And then sometimes you might have an added steroid, um, and this will help reduce airway inflammation. And then, of course, we talked about, Dr. Kern, you mentioned exacerbations earlier and how that's kind of like a concussion to your lungs. You really want to prevent them. And a good way to prevent them is actually just to get um, your flu shot. And so there are ton of, tons of places where flu shots are available. I believe Shoppers Drug Mart offers them quite often. And it's right downstairs from the clinic, so no excuses for not getting one. <laughs> um, and it's just a really easy way, in my opinion, to just kind of prevent that flare-up and that permanent damage that could incur from having a flare-up. And so at the end of the day, unfortunately, there hasn't really been a easy cure for COPD. So what your health routine will do is try to prevent COPD from getting worse. And that, it's a, it's a team effort from you as well as them. So they're going to focus on reducing symptoms, improve your exercise tolerance, improve your quality of life. So hopefully you won't experience as much breathlessness doing things that you'd like to do, um, as well as to prevent and treat exacerbations and just keep you alive. And so what you can do on that end is to make sure that you start having a healthy diet or continue having a healthy diet, as well as exercising as much as you are able to. Like Dr. Kearney mentioned, just losing 50 pounds or losing a, um, some weight could definitely help with your lungs and your ability to breathe properly. So the next section I'm going to be talking a little bit about how to properly use your inhaler. And so inhalers, if you go to the next slide, are just like a nickname for inhalation devices and you might also hear, um, refer to them as puffers. And so the great thing about inhalers is that it allows the medicine to be delivered directly into your lungs. And so some of the risks that you might get with, like, side effects um, from ingesting and ab absorbing it, so, like, any oral tablets, anything like that, um, is reduced because you're delivering the medicine directly to your lungs. And so oftentimes, because I'll show you within the next few slides, there's a lot of different choices for inhalers, and there's also questions, well, which one's right for me? And this is a discussion that you should be having with your um, healthcare team. It is definitely dependent on your preference. So what's available perhaps under OHIS? Um, what are the costs for it? As well as something else to consider is your ability to actually use it correctly. So for example, someone with arthritis may have to use a different kind of inhaler than someone who doesn't have um, any dexterity issues. And luckily we do have many, many different choices of inhaler. So if you would like to go to the next slide. So these are some respiratory medi medications, so tons available. And if you go to the next slide, um, these are specific for COPD. These are fantastic diagrams that you can probably look at later um, by pausing the video. 
And so if you look at, is it to the right, there are the combination inhalers. So a combination inhaler is basically a bronchodilator as well as a steroid. Um, so steroids are helpful for immunosuppression and reducing inflammation. So if you have asthma, this is um, helpful, but they may not work as well for COPD medication. And something else to consider is that um, most provincial drug plans will cover the cost of many inhalers for those of you who are over 65 years old. Um, and so if you don't have insurance coverage, this is definitely a conversation to have with your physician just to see like which one's the most cost effective for you as well as for your health. And don't be afraid to talk about cost of therapy because there are different costs to these different inhalers. And uh, many of us are, are don't be embarrassed. Um, there are certain things that you can afford or not afford and that there's there are different solutions. Also, mm -hmm. too, is that you know, steroids are good for, for asthma component, they're good for inflammation, but because steroids, they can actually increase the risk of infections as well. So we have to always balance the risk of infection versus making you feel better. And uh, so it's, a, it's really an individual decision about, um, for yourself and your doctor. So what we base things on are symptoms, what you, what you look like and sound like when we listen to your lungs, and also those spirometry values are so important to, to categorize you uh, to put you where, where, where the best plan of action or uh, take place for yourself. Wonderful. Keep going, Emma. Um, so under the medication categories, um, I believe this is more specifically for COPD, but can also be taken for any type of inhaler. There are the three main ones, the bronchodilator, also known as the reliever. There are the anti-inflammatories, the controllers, and then there are the antibiotics. So the bronchodilators are called relievers because typically they offer that kind of um, short-term relief. So you take it and you it finally feels as though you can breathe again. So it opens up your airway, it decreases your shortness in breath, and there are some that are long-acting as well as some that are short-acting. And then as for anti-inflammatories, these are called controllers. So typically they act a little bit more long-term in the sense that if you do take it, you won't feel that immediate relief. Um, but it will reduce the inflammation in your airway, so it will allow it to open up a little bit better. It will help prevent exacerbation. And this is really the one that if you are on an anti-inflammatory that you do take it daily or however many times you're supposed to, because this is it acts on a little bit more of a long-term basis and reduces the amount of mucus. And then lastly, um, there are antibiotics. And so these are typically done to treat lung infections. Sometimes they're also taken with oral steroids. Um, and I think they can also be used on a regular basis to reduce inflammation. Um, and you may also see it during when, if you have a flare-up or an exacerbation, you may also see your doctor prescribe it to you. So traditionally for uh, antibiotics, mm -hmm. they have to work for bacterial infection. So those are people with changing patterns of your sputum. It goes from clear to thick yellow, thick green. Uh, you start to de develop a fever, you're increasing cough. If there's signs of infection going on, many times people want antibiotics, but if you have a viral illness, antibiotics aren't going to help you. So you and your physician need to work on that together to decide if that's going to be helpful to you. But you can see there's, there's quite a few therapies for this. Um, and then, so over the next few slides, um, we're going to probably watch a little bit of a video about three different types of inhalers. So if you see right across the top bar, there are the soft mist inhaler, the dry powder inhaler, as well as the meter dose inhaler. And so there's this great website um, called the Lung Association, and they have videos about how to use, I think, like maybe tens of different types of um, inhalers. So if you are having difficulty, this is a great resource for you. So yeah, we can just click on that. The Respimat device comes in two pieces, the inhaler and a medication cartridge. Before it is used the first time, it will need to be assembled and primed. With the cap closed, press the safety catch to remove the clear base of the inhaler. Push the narrow end of the cartridge into the inhaler as far as it will go. Place the inhaler upright on a firm surface and push firmly down on the inhaler to ensure the cartridge has gone all the way in. Put the clear base back into place. To prime the inhaler for use, hold the inhaler upright with the cap closed. 
Turn the base in the direction of the arrows until it clicks. Flip the cap open. Point the inhaler down and press the dose release button. Close the cap. Repeat this three more times. Now to use the inhaler, follow these steps. Hold the inhaler upright with the cap closed. Turn the clear base a half turn in the direction of the arrows until you hear a click. Flip the cap open. Breathe out fully and slowly. Close your lips around the mouthpiece without covering the air vents. Point the inhaler towards the back of the throat. While taking in a slow deep breath, press the dose release button and continue to breathe in slowly. Remove the inhaler from your mouth and hold your breath for 5 to 10 seconds. Breathe out. Close the cap and if another dose is required, repeat these steps. So if we go to the next slide. Very good. Figuring out how to escape this. <laughs> Whoa, that wasn't it. So learning how to use um, inhalers takes a little bit takes a little bit of work, and it's something that we're all learning to do. And these videos can be helpful. And uh, one of the things is um, uh, Corinne's been very helpful at, at helping us uh, use these, and your pharmacist can be helpful too as well. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, when you good. sorry, when you do you want to make it full screen again? It's just right beside the exit button. There's two to the left of that. Yeah, right there. And then. Hit that, and then you can hit the again. It is not working for some reason. <laughs> That's so okay. I will try clicking exit and then re-entering it again. Yes, yeah, so you're all learning how to use this technology, and that's good. And one of the things is that, that we have Sonia um, teaching us all on technology. She has a series of videos. Um, she's also Friday night. She calls from Vancouver, and she called a number of patients today. So if you want to learn how to use technology better, um, I can't think of a better person than Sonia, and she she should help you so uh, um, well. It's good to learn new technologies and stuff like that. Go ahead. Um, so, some things to keep in mind that if you are using Restimat, there's a lot of great pros, um, and then so I'll just focus on the cons. Um, there is, as you saw in the actual video, there is the initial cartridge loading, and that did take some time with the three times um, letting the dosage out and whatnot, as well as the priming. So again, this is a conversation you would have with your healthcare provider. It's like, if I don't have the dexterity to do this and I don't have someone near me to help me all the time, what what's another better option for me? And then if we move on to the next one, Turbuhaler is a type of dry powder inhaler and we'll just watch the video now. I think I'm gonna leave it not full screen this time. Yeah. <laughs> Hold the inhaler upright and twist the cap off. Turn the base in one direction and back until you hear a click. Breathe out away from the turbuhaler. Seal your lips around the mouthpiece and breathe in quickly and deeply. Hold your breath for 5 to 10 seconds. Then breathe out. If you need a second puff, repeat these steps. When you're finished, place the cap on, twist to close, and then rinse your mouth. So some pros and cons with Turby Hitler include that the cons include the double turn might be confusing as you see by the video. Um, and then it's also, I believe, a little more confusing to tell when it's actually empty. There's a little bit of priming necessary and it is more sensitive to moisture compared to some of the other inhalers. And then lastly, there's the meter dose inhaler. And I think this is the one that I, I recognize immediately. So you can watch the video now.
Remove the cap. Shake the inhaler. Breathe out. Seal your lips around the mouthpiece and start to breathe in slowly. Press your inhaler once and keep breathing in slow and deep. Remove the mouthpiece and hold your breath for 5 to 10 seconds. Breathe out. If another puff is required, wait at least 30 to 60 seconds and repeat all these steps. Replace the cap and then rinse your mouth with water. So some pros for this is definitely familiar. It is quite portable as you can tell. It's like maybe about five, five, six inches. And then however some cons are that typically what you actually want to do is to also use a spacer or a holding chamber. So it's just like an extra attachment in front of the inhaler, between the inhaler and your face. And so what it does is that it actually increases your chances of getting more medicine into your lungs. Um, and it decreases the need for actuation and inhalation, so the coordination of ejecting the medicine and breathing in. Um, and it could also help with some dexterity issues. So if you do have arthritis or some um, dexterity issues, this might be a good fit for you. And of course, something that comes with use, um, repeated use, the spacers, also known as holding chambers, do need to be replaced and cleaned as per the manufacturer's um, instructions. So inhaler use technique, it's super, super important because if you don't have this technique down pat, that means the medicine isn't getting into your lungs, it isn't getting where it's supposed to be as effectively as it should be. So some questions to ask yourself if you're having any trouble with inhaler technique use, and just to think about, I guess, as you progress, but have I actually ever seen how to use one? Um, so have I seen either like a therapist show me how to use one? Have I seen my pharmacist? Show me how to use one. And then a really good practice to get into is to show that person. So show your doctor, has, have they seen me have, um, use one? And with that, they can correct you right away. It's like, oh, actually, it's better if you place your hand over here. It's better if you breathe in more quickly. So stuff like that. And what's insanely important is that you follow all the instructions every single time. There should absolutely be no shortcuts taken when you do use inhalers. So, for example, um, make sure that you take it regularly, not just when you feel like it. So, if it tells you to take it daily, make sure you take it daily. And a great way to do all of this is just to practice, practice, and practice. And so, I kind of alluded to this, but the really big danger is that if you don't experience any improvements in your symptoms, um, that is actually because you, you're not getting the medication into your system properly, your doctor might think, oh, they actually need more medications or they need a stronger dose. And then that could definitely have other effects that you don't want it to. So if we move on to the next slide, these, are, these five sentences are just like a quick checkpoint to see are you actually using the inhalers correctly? And if you answer yes to any of these, it's probably um, time to go and check with your doctor to see if you're using it correctly. So just quickly read them out and just answer in your mind to see if you answer yes or no. So, statement one, I find it difficult to inhale my medication. On bad days, it is hard to breathe in my medicine. I can't tell if I have used my inhaler correctly. I am not sure if I'm getting all the medicine I need, and I don't know if my medicine is coming out. And I do want to say that you don't necessarily have to feel bad about it, because six in ten Canadians have challenges with inhalers. However, it is essential that you learn from your mistakes, that you don't just continue repeating them. So seek the help that you need to make sure that you're using it correctly and then continue to use it correctly. Okay, so we're now going to move on to restrictive lung diseases. Um, so again, restrictive lung, lung disease refers to a group of lung diseases that actually prevent the lungs from fully expanding with air. And this makes breathing difficult because there's a decrease in the total volume of air that the lungs are actually able to hold. Um, and oftentimes these restrictive lung diseases are progressive, so they actually get worse over time. And again, this is different from obstructive, which includes COPD, because those conditions make it hard to exhale all the air in the lungs, whereas restrictive um, affects inhalation. So we see here that there are actually two types of restrictive lung diseases. Problems with the lungs themselves cause pulmonary restrictive lung disease, 
And the underlying diseases that are associated with pulmonary restricted lung diseases include pulmonary fibrosis, which occurs when the lung tissue is damaged and scarred. There's also pneumoconiosis, which occurs when tiny particles like dust damage the lungs. And then we have pulmonary edema, which is a condition caused by excess fluid in the lungs and the other, um, other uh, such conditions that are also listed. In contrast, problems outside of the lungs cause extra pulmonary restrictive lung diseases. And these problems essentially place pressure on the lungs, which makes it difficult for them to expand. And common factors that have been associated with this type of lung disease is um, are obesity, pregnancy, neuromuscular disorders, and more. Dr. Kearney, are you there? Yep. Pulmonary edema is related to cardiac illnesses as well, right? Did you want to touch upon that? Yeah, so one of the things is, uh, as we talked about, the lungs and the heart are, are intertwined. So if the heart's not pumping properly, you have back pressure in the lung called congestive heart failure, and that's fluid. So um, that's a heart problem, and the lungs are just the innocent bystanders. So again, congestive heart failure, the heart can't pump properly because heart muscles weaken, valves don't work, or the heart's stiff and it has to work at a higher pressure. So congestive heart failure is really... Um, a problem of the lungs. Now you can get something called, um, uh, you, you can get non-cardiac uh, pulmonary edema where the pressures are low. That can be due from inhalation injuries, um, it can be seen from COVID-19, some certain infections can do this as well. So it's a different present where, where actually the, the alveoli, the, the linings of the lungs are actually leaking fluid um, and they're leaking fluid because they're damaged. So, uh, so the, the, the heart failure we think of from the, from the heart not pumping properly or you can have flu in the lungs because the lung tissue itself is down. Okay. Great question. Go ahead there, Koshi. Yeah. So next we have a video here, and this is just going to provide you with a better understanding of pulmonary fibrosis. So we can take a look at that. I love this video. <laughs> See these little coffee stirs? You ever tried to breathe through one? That's exactly what having pulmonary fibrosis is like. No matter how hard you try, you can't get enough air. Christmas Eve 2008, I got a call from my doctor. At work, I was a, a firefighter, and we had to do a breathing test every year. Well, it came back that I flunked. I uh, went in and had my lungs tested to determine what, what was wrong with them. And the doctor called and told me, you have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I was scared. First thing I thought was the things I'd be missing. My wife, Marlene, my kids, grandkids, everything. I knew I wanted to live my life to the fullest, the amount of time that I had left. So Marlene and I did a lot of research, found a doctor we wanted to go see and made an appointment. Pulmonary fibrosis, in the literal sense, is scarring in the lung. When the soft tissue of the lung becomes scarred, it becomes much more difficult for oxygen to pass from the air sacs into the bloodstream. There are many causes of pulmonary fibrosis, and after a close evaluation, if no cause is found, we then refer to it as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF. If you've been diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, there are steps you can take to make living with this disease easier. Oxygen therapy may be prescribed. Pulmonary rehabilitation will help keep you active and maintain your quality of life. You may be eligible for clinical trials. And for some patients, pulmonary lung transplantation is an option. If you've been diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, while there is no cure for this disease, there are approved medications which help slow its progression. The most important thing you can do is speak with your physician about what treatment options are best for you. Okay, so now we're going to take a closer look at pneumoconiosis and pulmonary edema. We'll start with the pneumoconiosis. Yeah. So pneumoconiosis actually refers to a group of occupational lung diseases that's caused by inhalation of organic or inorganic dust particles that cause lung damage. Um, the primary cause is a usually work-related exposure where dust particle particles are more likely to be encountered. 
Usually, the, the disease will manifest chronically, taking about a decade or more to develop. And research actually indicates that smokers are obviously at an increased risk, so something to factor in. Um, and common symptoms include cough and dyspnea. And yeah, we'll watch the rest of the video in the meantime. Should I unmute it or leave it? Sure, no, it's just like background music. Oh, okay. <laughs> So now we're going to take a look at pulmonary edema. The thing to remember is that if you're around dust or pollute, wear a mask, wear proper yeah. right. Pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is a disease where the lungs fill up with fluid. We have a patient in the hospital right now with pulmonary edema. The nurse described it as a sponge. If your lungs are a sponge, normally the sponge is dry. However, if that sponge is totally saturated with water, that's what the lungs are like with pulmonary edema. Symptoms of pulmonary edema would include extreme shortness of breath, often a cough with a clear sputum. Um, and uh, when the physician uh, examines the patient, they would hear lots of crackling in the lungs. Sometimes the patient is aware of that crackling as part of their symptoms. Treatment of pulmonary edema uh, involves, number one, figuring out what the underlying cause is, oftentimes a heart attack or a weakened heart. Number two, would be uh, the administration of a drug like furosemide or Lasix, which will cause the patient to urinate out a large amounts of fluid, which will clear the lungs of the fluid condition. Uh, if there is a heart attack, again, treating the underlying disease uh, would, would be very beneficial in the treatment of pulmonary edema. So restrictive lung diseases have similar symptoms, um, as we saw as to obstructive lung diseases. And those symptoms include shortness of breath, chronic cough, anxiety, fatigue, and chest pains, and more. Um, oftentimes, to diagnose these diseases, a doctor will normally perform pulmonary function tests, which we saw before, uh, were also known as spirometry tests. Um, and they use those to test your uh, total lung capacity, which is usually decreased in restrictive lung disease. Um, other tests may also be necessary for a full diagnosis and a full understanding. Um, to ensure the correct treatment plan is arranged. Commonly used tests for uh, restrictive lung diseases include spirometry tests, as previously mentioned, a chest x-ray, CT scans, and bronchoscopy, where a flexible tube is actually inserted through the nose or mouth, and it has a camera on its end, so it allows um, the doctors to see inside your airways. Um, treatment usually involves lifestyle changes, like losing weight or breath conditioning with uh, deep breathing exercises. You can also use medications and oxygen therapy, stem cell therapy, and in extreme cases, you may need a lung transplant. We can move on to the next slide. So, so just, just to mention, if, if you just backtrack one slide there, is yeah. we learned that um, one of the questions is, I, one of, the, one of our, our, our viewers said, I have lung cancer, I'm sorry, I had breast cancer. What's the cause? You can see, do I have intrinsic lung problems? And a lot of these intrinsic lung problems or we call it idiopathic, we don't know the cause to, to find that. Or some of them are, are self-inflicted because I, I, I smoked. One very clear to me is that you can make breathing better by exercise, by becoming more fitness, retraining your lungs, losing weight. And so it's really quite a quite a fascination that, you know, um, and most people nowadays, you know, don't just have one problem, they have more than one chronic disease. So, you know, I have diabetes, I have high blood pressure, I have lung problems, I have heart problems, and how to sort that out is really, uh, it can be a tough job sometimes. When you hear about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, when I first started medical school, the average survival was about six months. That disease has changed quite a bit because we learned to pick it up earlier. There's multiple forms of this process, and uh, some are slow progressors, some are more rapidly progressive. And we do have medications that retard the rate of progression. Making the right diagnosis is not so so always easy, and you may require more than one doctor involved. So yeah. when someone says, I'm short of breaths, we have lots to think about. Go ahead there, um, um, let's move forward. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
we gave you guys a lot of information so far, but of course we want to help you guys find the best ways to manage your lung conditions. So we're just going to take a quick look at some resources that you can use. Um, so caring for my COPD is actually a 10 week pulmonary rehabilitation program. That's for people who have been diagnosed with COPD as well as those that have been recently hospitalized due to the condition. And it's a health center located in Hamilton. You can get access to the referral form, which needs to be signed by a doctor through their website. The links on the screen are also um, there for you to be guided to their website and the referral form itself as well. So you can take a look at that later whenever you'd like. So now these are some at-home devices that you can um, buy and have at home to use. So the first one, the breather, is actually a really good example for a tool that you can use at home to improve your breathing if you have a lung disease. And basically, it trains your respiratory muscles and aims to restore disrupted breathing patterns. So you can follow the link to check out the product on Amazon.ca. And there's also many different types that you can find online. So it's just uh, basically a device to help you with deep breathing exercises. And the next one we have over here is the MIR Spiral Bank Smart. Um, it's an ideal device for monitoring any respiratory illnesses that you have, and as well as um, in the self-management of COPD and other lung diseases. Um, then we also similarly have a Nuvo Air on the right, which is an integrated ecosystem to monitor your respiratory health and basically improve the lives of those suffering with lung problems. Um, it also helps physicians in making better and faster clinical decisions. So sometimes you also see um, physicians using that device. So these the next things interesting right now is that um, we're now entering a, uh, an era where, where people are becoming more involved in their health. And where these fit in, how they should fit in is, 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 is we're learning. I think it's important. I think you need to take an active interest in your health. What the, how to match the best technology with the best of lifestyle changes becoming more and more important. Look, we started off with Fitbit. I have my Fitbit over here. We have home blood pressure monitoring. Um, I still need the device that stops me from eating at nighttime. I haven't found that device. I'm not sure if anybody can find that for me. Um, Doctor, can you think a simple lock on your fridge might help? <laughs> <laughs> And we'll have to try that one. Um, <laughs> what about duct tape? What's that? Duct tape. <laughs> duct tape is good. <laughs> um, and so uh, we all have our, our, our strengths and weaknesses. Um, but I'm really impressed that there are there are devices you can actually use on yourself. Because one of the things right now is that uh, with this COVID situation is that we're afraid to aerosolize secretion so getting breathing tests done is not going to be so easy at the time but measuring it yourself is a, is, a, is a great idea and learning to do that so i'm quite intrigued is that you know is that um, um so thank you for sharing those and we'll, we'll keep learning about this um corinne do you have any uh, advice on home monitoring of your lungs at all um i i like the idea of of uh, a, a peak flow device. I think you referred to the, the spirometers that you might be able to buy. I, and I also think uh, sometimes for people with severe COPD, a, a good thing is a, um, an oximeter. And they're, they're easily available. Yeah, so for less than $100, you can see how much oxygen is in your bloodstream. Uh, I think also just a, a thermometer at home, knowing your temperature is kind of important. Uh, a very important device is called a scale. Um, you can track it <laughs> weight. Um, and duct tape for me. <laughs> um, so uh, we're learning. Uh, and uh, Christian and Emma, did you find any more information about different devices that you want to share with us and how we're learning about this? Um, I went to a couple talks and I was starting to learn about this. So this is an evolving field. So if people out there have found devices... Let us know what you found, and we'll try to help evaluate it. Um, and we'll try to help figure that out whether it's the right device for you or not. So that's an area that's it's evolving right now. Um, I think it's a great area. And where it's going to go right now, I'm not sure. But I like looking at things on a personal level and how it affects me. Um, so that's wonderful. So uh, keep going. Thanks.
Okay, so yeah, these next two slides actually provide you with really good resources to educate yourself. That's something um, that you're looking for on your conditions. And you can also find some guidance to um, stop smoking and be a part of a community. Um, so feel free to screenshot these, this information or you can come back to it um, and go through the recording afterwards if that's something you're interested in. And we can move on to, we can go to the next slide. Okay. So in this video, we have um, physical therapists Bob Shrupp and Brad Hennick, who are going to demonstrate um, really good top three exercises that are really helpful for COPD or um, for anyone who has breathing difficulties in general. So they're going to demonstrate what those three exercises are, um, so how you can do them at home comfortably. Hi, I'm Bob Shaw, physical therapist. Brad Heineck, physical therapist. Together, we're the most famous physical therapists on the internet, Brad. In our opinion, of course, Bob. Right, today, we're going to talk about top three exercises that you can use for someone who has COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or just basically these are breathing exercises you can use for anybody who's having some difficulty with breathing, or it, it's also a good one for relaxation. Sure. Believe it or not. So this is, we'll go through the three. The first one is a very basic one, very common mm -hmm. one. And basically, what you're trying to do, you're going to breathe in through the nose, which we call like smelling a flower. Yep. And then you're going to like blow out a candle. Right. So you're breathing in, and you're doing pursed lips on the way out. Yeah. So you're starting off, you're, what you like to do is to do to kind of a two to one ratio is that you're breathing mm -hmm. in for two seconds. 1,001, 1,002. And you're blowing out for four seconds. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. You're going to find out most of you cannot even do that. So right. It's very difficult to do. I've heard people say breathing out, pretending like you're breathing through a straw, your lip going through a straw. We're breathing out through a straw. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the basic one you can do throughout the day. You can repeat it you know, multiple times. Um, it, it's just an easy one to do wherever you're at. Trying to get more air in, more air out, you know, and trying to expand your lungs. Be relaxed. If you're relaxed. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Brad. It, a lot of people get very anxious with COPD. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. They're worried about the breathing, and I, honestly, you know, they have a good re reason to be. But you want to make sure you have good posture. Posture up. And a lot of times, even maybe relaxing those shoulders. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, um, the other thing, before we go on any further, it may not be a bad idea to get a pulse oximeter. You can buy these at Walgreens and a lot of general stores now, or look online. So again, um, it's a pulse oximeter, and you yeah. put it on your finger, tell us how much oxygen is in your blood. Right. Percent-wise, it should be above 90%. It kind of gives you a little incentive because you can see, you know, if you're at like below 90%, you can work on these exercises. I, I bet you over time you will see that they will improve. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can see the improvement. So, Brad, do you want to show um, diaphragmatic breathing laying down? Sure. I'll grab a pillow for you. So diaphragmatic breathing, again, just like it says, from the diaphragm, and remember the diaphragm, if you're not familiar with it, is in the rib cage and it separates the rib cage from your abdominal contents, and it's a broad muscle, like a pancake, all spread out, and you need to learn... If you're using your diaphragm, you're doing a lot more efficient breathing. Right. So you're going to... The best way to learn diaphragmatic breathing is first laying down, which mm -hmm. is a lot easier to do it. Now, in today's society, everyone's talking about having a flat stomach, and that's the worst thing you can think about for healthy breathing. I read a whole book on this once they talked about this whole concept of social idea of, of the stomach, but you want to breathe out, you breathe in, and you have to be relaxed again. See how his belly expands when he breathes in. So that diaphragm is allowing the lungs to fill up by going down, and the, the stomach has to come up for that, and then... You want to get accustomed to doing this first laying down, and then you're going to translate it to sitting up. And this is the kind of breathing you want to do all the time. Right. So you can put your hand on your belly even, and a lot of times it gives you the feedback. You want to see the chest moving very little when you do this. You might feel the lower ribs, but... So you, you can do your in through the nose and out through the uh, mouth yet, even with this type of Sure. Thing. And it just goes against everything because, right. you know, you're always thinking, right, does it? yeah, because you're going to get fat. Belly sticks out fat, but that's good you for breathing. Take a breath. Because you spend, oh, you want to let the, the, the belly go out instead. Right. Well, the third one is the fun one. Yeah. This, yeah. Is the, this is the fun way to improve your breathing. 
And what you want to do is get a little harmonica. This is my kid's harmonica. Sure. And it's a uh, owner. That's the most popular brand. Right? Wow. Well, I don't know about that, Bob, but whatever you say. All right, so, uh, I mean, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, sites on the Internet that will have the songs all laid out for sure. you. Sure. And uh, what they usually do is they'll, you can create a note by blowing out. And create a note by blowing in. And so what those, on the, on the little songs, they'll have B for blowing, D for drawing in. Okay. So, um, you know, you can start off just, anybody can do this. You got the first lips. Okay. And while you're doing this, are you thinking about the diaphragmatic and breathing too? You can throw that in there too. Sure. But, and, but there's whole groups that get together and do these songs with people with COPD. Sure. And so, so it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of, you know, uh, camaraderie. Right. Plus there's this one lady who I saw on the internet, she was talking that she, whenever she stopped doing her O2 sats and start O2 saturation, it started to go down. Sure. Less so, oxygen yeah. in the blood. So, I give my hat, Brad. Okay, yeah, let's see a little uh, presentation. Uh, he is the entertainer. Garvin, <laughs> do you have any? Tips on techniques that are a bit more accessible than a harmonica. <laughs> I, oh, I, I'm not sorry. It's Karen speaking. I, I like the uh, first lip breathing, and those are just helpful tools that the uh, famous physiotherapists have ex have talked about. Fantastic. Okay. So. Um, again, and for this last section, we're just going to be talking about smoking cessation. And so there is going to be another presentation about this that may or may not be pre-recorded that will be available to you within the next few coming weeks. And so quitting smoking, COVID-19 might just be the biggest sign from the universe that it's time. <laughs> <laughs> and as you all, as you've already heard from all of us, that smoking is the leading cause of COPD. So individuals who smoke have a 50% chance of developing COPD and are over 20 times more likely to develop lung cancer. And of course, that doesn't only stop at cancer of the lungs. It can also go to the liver, the cervical, colon, rectal, pancreatic, and so many more cancers um, on here. And basically, the scientific reasoning behind this is that the cigarette chemicals that are in um, cigarettes uh, will lead to more reactive oxygen species. And so reactive oxygen species will wreak, wreak havoc on all of your DNA and all of the important stuff in your body, which will increase the mutation, the risk of mutation. And of course, if you do have mutations, that can lead to cancer. So lung diseases such as COPD, um, uh, such as COPD, infections, asthma are more likely. And there's also a greater risk of infertility, erectile dysfunction, and heart disease. And so actually, in smokers who are age 55 to 77, we found that 50% of them have heart disease. So if we, if we think about it, if you have um, 10 friends who smoke, by the time they're about 55 or 77, chances are half of them, five of them, will have heart disease. And that's, that's a lot. That's, that's a scary amount of scary number. And so this correlation can be explained by scientific evidence showing that chemicals in cigarettes can damage and cause hardening and narrowing of your blood vessels, which makes your circulation in your blood poor. Your blood isn't getting to the places where it's supposed to be. As well, you'll have greater risk of blood vessels closing up or becoming clogged, so such as um, having a MI or a stroke. <laughs> and so there's also... Sarah, go ahead. Sorry. We can also have, we're likely to have Alzheimer's disease, we're likely to lose limbs, bad, bad ulcers, it, it just goes on and on. So um, I'm trying to think of a good thing about smoking, um, is that um, if that's your best strat stress management strategy, um, let's find a better way. Exactly. And there's also a high risk of diabetes as well. 
smokers are 30 to 40 percent more at risk of diabetes. And of course, if you have a smoke, if you are a smoker and then you develop diabetes or you have it, your risk of developing then heart disease increases significantly. There's just so much damage going on. And so if even if you reduce smoking or cut it out completely, it would make a huge change on your health. So let's take a look. And I know it's not it's not an easy thing to stop. You know, it, it, it's a no. terrible addictive problem. Um, you know, the smoking industry has spent uh, uh, you know thirty years um, developing substances that are they're addictive, um, they're deadly, they're harmful, they, they, they cause misery. And I know that most of us are, are struggling with this, so I, I don't want to say it's it's not. Uh, you know, don't don't go around feeling guilty, ashamed. Come around and say, listen, I'm still trying to duct tape at nighttime to stop eating. Uh, I'm still going to go around fighting. We all have our, you know, our, our, our devils and our, and our, and our things, but we, we, we can help. And uh, we want to work at this. But work at it. That's all I can ask. Exactly. And that's what we're, the volunteers are here for, too, to provide some of the resources that are available to you and help you in this very difficult journey for sure. So when we take a look at what happens when you actually stop smoking on the days, the weeks and the months and years level. So on the day, your risk for coronary artery disease and heart attacks starts decreasing. So as soon as you put down your last cigarette or you decrease it, um, the decreasing amount you're smoking, your risk for heart attacks and all of the diseases decrease. And then, however, at around the three-day mark, that's when there's no more nicotine left in your body. So that's when you will be experiencing a lot more withdrawal symptoms. And then at the weeks level, so when we take a look at what happens at the two-week level, we see that the withdrawal symptoms should have started to decrease a little. You might not have as strong of a craving anymore or any of the nasty withdrawal symptoms as well. Your heart function and your blood circulation, they start to improve. And you'll find that it's actually easier to breathe and exercise. You might be able to go up maybe five, ten more stairs than usual, and you, you can feel it changing. And then on the month and years level, you'll see that your lungs start to repair and that there will be less coughing. And then by nine months, um, your withdrawal symptoms should be gone. And then as well, the risk of heart disease and um, other concerns, health concerns, are now half. So it's, it's great improvement. And so over the next few slides, we'll be offering some different quit strategies. And of course, this is definitely something that you should be, um, especially some of the ones that are like nicotine replacement therapy, something you should be discussing with your doctors too to see what's out there. And again, like Dr. Kern, you said before, don't be um, scared to talk about um, some of the financial concerns and see which one best fits you. And we'll have a slide on that later, too. So nicotine replacement therapy, there are patches, long-acting, as well as gum, short-acting. And sometimes it can help that you have an oral substitute or something that you can fiddle with So it, um, when you do get cravings. There's also lozenges as well as sprays. And another important thing that's part of quitting is to avoid triggers. So, for example, um, oftentimes smoking is used as a way to kind of deal with, cope with anxiety and stress. And so a good idea is just to see if you can move that elsewhere. Um, so I think an example that we have in notes for it included exercising, just channeling that stress and anxiety into more exercise, which is also then more beneficial for your health as well as make sure that you avoid the routines where you normally smoke. So if there's like a certain time of day or a certain thing that triggers your smoking in your routine, try to avoid that best you can, as well as social groups that smoke. Um, and so some other behavioral changes that could be used, such as stress ball, elastic bands, just something to occupy your hands and something to occupy your mouth, so such as gum, and as well as like the nicotine replacement gum. Um, and some other ideas is smoke with your non-dominant hand or find even find a quit buddy. So find someone that you can kind of go through this journey with, share your stress and share your frustration, but know that you're in it together. So then as for nicotine patches, it, it can help you wean off cigarettes um, a little bit more easily. So unfortunately, Stop on the road is currently not running or sending free nicotine replacement or uh, therapy kit. However, there is an alternative, so this would be a good time to either screenshot or just remember that this is here. Um, so then if you call them and then go through option two and option four, 
you'll go through like a little bit of a screening process, 15 minutes, and you'll be registered, and then you can, you'll be placed on the waiting list. And when they do have um, some time for you, uh, they will call you again to discuss some options. I forgot to include on this slide, CMH, the Nicotine Dependence Clinic, will be providing you with five weeks of free NRT if you do register. There is a waiting list currently. Uh, once it's all settled, they're still running through phone and also by mailing NRT to their clients. Thank you. There's all sorts of options, and they'll keep changing. So the important thing is to try different things and to try often. Um, most people will take four to ten times to stop smoking, and uh, you learn from successes. Everything's connected. Um, and then on to the next slide, you can see a general kind of um, different types of if you were to smoke this much per day and how much nicotine you should be using. Yeah, so for example, if you smoke less than 10 cigarettes a day, then 14 milligrams times six weeks, um, and then you would switch on to seven milligrams times two weeks. And again, this will all become clearer um, depending on which group you fall under and then, of course, a discussion with your physician as well as any of the um, help helping lines that are available to you. So Nicorette patches come in 7, 14, and 20 milligram patches. You usually wear them for a, a day. If you have nightmares, you can sometimes take it off at, at night time. R roughly, if you smoke 7 cigarettes a day, then 7 milligrams. 21 a yeah, pack, 21 milligrams are patches. But you can sometimes use two sometimes or, or different combinations of the above. You will not get the quick release, the quick um, um, It'll help decrease the cravings. It won't make it all go away, but it certainly makes a huge difference. It doubles your success rate. So some other medications, and we've included the prices over here um, that are available to you, include Zyban. So this is also a good antidepressant. So if you do have depression, this might be a good choice for you. And this could this may be covered by insurance as well. There's also Champix. Um, and then this is good for reducing withdrawal symptoms. So if you have any cravings, this might be the one for you. And so if you see at the very bottom of that line, it says Ontario Drug Benefit Program can reimburse treatment for either of these medications for a maximum of 12 weeks each year. So you have about three months of the year covered under the Ontario Drug Benefit Program. So this is a great conversation to have with your pharmacist as well as um, your healthcare team just to see which one of these options is best for you, both financially and which one will do the best for your ability to play. And then so on to the next slide. This is a beautiful chart that Winnie made up. And this is a perfect time to take a picture or a screenshot for later reference. And these are just some ideas that you can use for your basic clip plan. And it's a great way to just kind of see if maybe you haven't tried some of these um, tips and tricks to try them. So, for example, um, I like this one. So, tell your friends and family that you are quitting. It's great that you that they know they have so that you have that support, and perhaps they can find different ways to kind of distract you during that time. They'll be like, "Hey, do you want to go watch this new movie I found?" and just keep you distracted for um, that time. And so, if we move on to the next slide, like Dr. Kearney said. I, I believe it's like four to ten times it the average amount of times it takes to quit. So relapsing is completely normal and typical. It's, it's totally fine. So re the important thing is that you reach out to your support group, including your healthcare um, team, as well as the volunteers here. And it's what matters is that you don't give up, right? So one of these attempts, sooner or later, it will be the one where you quit completely. And you should never lose hope and know that it's normal that it takes people some time to quit. And then some other resources and support for quitting smoking. We have the Smokers 24-hour helpline. There's over 100 different languages, and they're all trained, as well as there is phone and text message support, as well as the online quit program. This is a great resource to check out. There's also Quit Now. And then if you are in Hamilton, this is a great Hamilton-specific one, known as Hamilton Quit Smoking. And then continued, um, there are some apps. So these are things that you can easily download on your phone, such as My Quit Coach, Quit Smoking, Quit Now, and then Quit, spelled differently. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are also some great YouTube videos that you can check out. 
So Dr. Mike Evans, and then one of my personal favorite channels, ASAP Science. They make short little videos, great kind of um, cartoon characters that they cut out and draw. It gives you a ton of information. Um, and did anyone have anything else to add? Otherwise, um, we would just like to say thank you for listening. And if you would like any other support with smoking cessation or anything else about, have any questions about this, please don't hesitate to reach out. You have our email right there. And of course, you can always check out Dr. Kermu's website. Well, I'm going to do this nice little cartoon of Dr. Kermu there on the screen as well. <laughs> <laughs> I need duct tape there, do I? <laughs> uh, I start off the day good and that the day eating too much. And, you know, it, it's okay. Um, I'm getting there. Um, and we all have our ups and downs. Like, Paul, we started this uh, a few months ago. Who thought that we'd be spending Friday nights together? Um, uh, I have all these wonderful people. Uh, uh, you are my family, and uh, you guys did a wonderful job. But first of all, I want to thank Krishi, Emma, Willie, and Corinne for spending this time and effort to make this happen. And so, wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, I know for many people, they're, You're welcome. they're sore. <laughs> and it's, that, um, it's a lot to absorb, and it's a lot to think about. The, the message is, if you're waiting for symptoms, the disease is very far advanced. Uh, your body has the ability to compensate for a long time. So that's why I think doing spirometry uh, before you have a problem is a good idea finding out your lung age. If you have a lung problem, you have asthma, you have COPD, you have pulmonary fibrosis, or other lung disease, you gotta find out. Um, so we start off with a question is that I have, I've had breast cancer, what's going on? Um, you need to sort that out. And uh, I, I think this is a wonderful webinar to go back and look at and to, to judge. There's some words of wisdom here about um, what you can do. The most important thing is you give up, keep trying, keep working, and help somebody else. So what I'm going to do is that um, um, I'm going to buy some Nicorette replacement therapy or I'm going to get some Champex or Zyban for somebody uh, who's really serious about wanting to uh, stop smoking. Um, and wants to work at it. So uh, it's a great gift to somebody. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's so much to think about. And, uh, you know, with this with this new way of looking at the world, it's taught me that what's really important, and what's really important is just to keep working hard to get better. And uh, we're all doing that. Um, any questions out there, Paul? No, things seem clear. Okay. Um, it, might, it might also be a lot to absorb at once, so, you know, it is recorded, so don't hesitate to go through it again and again as many times as you need on YouTube. You know, it's, it's funny is that I've been thinking about medicine for the last 40-something years. Um, uh, it, it is confusing, lots to learn, and um, I'm learning all the time, and uh, I wish I could take um, my drive, put it into your brain, and uh, we move forward. Uh, as my brain gets older... It doesn't think as fast, but it, uh, it, I think it learns to uh, value um, and to, to pass better judgment, make their decisions. So my decision for, for all of you is to just keep keep working, keep getting better. Uh, ladies, you did a fantastic job tonight, and uh, I, I thank you, and uh, you very impressive. Um, well done, girls. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for helping out. Yeah. This was a nice team effort. Everyone was so engaged. And uh, thanks for having us. And uh, we have a lot more help to do too as well. So if you need any help, go to drkernu at 232gmail.com. Remember, if you have want to get together, uh, we, we're working in the clinic. We're working on the phone. Um, I always say is I'll get to you uh, within uh, a few hours. Um, it's like when the repair person tells you they're going to come over, you have to give them a number of time when you... We expect something from us. We'll, we'll, we'll get to you, but we, we're, we're, we're going to deal with the sickest first, people first. We have emergencies, and that's okay. But uh, we value uh, your health, and uh, we value prevention. And uh, uh, Paul, you have the last word. All right. So, um, Chrissy, Emma, Winnie, 
and Corinne did an amazing talk today, very informative. Even I learned some new things today about lung disease. Um, I do think that one of my favorite things about the talk they gave was a lot of the resources they provided and a lot of the videos that they showed us. Um, you know, lung disease, like Dr. Pretty mentioned, is uh, not something that's easy to take care of. Dr. Pretty's asking for us to lose weight and to quit smoking, and those two are probably some of the most difficult challenges um, you or your loved ones or your friends might be facing. Uh, but I do like to note that um, Winnie and then Kushi ended off on and that, you know, we're in this together. Uh, if you do need any support from us at clinic or you can find support from your family or friends, whoever it is, just drag them in there with you and keep working away at it. It is going to take multiple tries and that's okay as long as you don't give up. Um, yeah, so hopefully you're able to take something away from this and uh, are able to, you know, have a better insight on your lung disease as well. Well, with that, um, we'll bid you all good night. We're going to sit and chat a little bit more. Anybody who wants to sit and chat with us are always welcome for us as well as review how we did. We're always looking to get better. And remember, just work with things, get better. Uh, make everybody else better and uh, have a great night and we'll we'll see you next week and remember uh, if you know somebody who needs some help reach out if if we can help we'd glad to but uh, share these links with other people as well the more the merrier everybody's welcome have a have a great night everyone good night everybody be safe good night doctor How do I stop sharing? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, at the top, you bring your wrist all the way to the top. Whoa, okay. Well done, ladies.